Hello and welcome everybody, my name is Forrest with Rocky Mountain School of Photography and today we are going to take a look at one of my, actually my favorite, little piece of astrophotography equipment and that is the Fornax Light Track 2. So this thing is awesome, uh, but before we get into it, I want to just do the quick explanation of what a tracker is. Um, a tracker for astrophotography is basically a little device that has a motor in it, and that little motor turns a wheel that rotates once every 24 hours. And the reason that we use these as astrophotographers is they allow us to keep one star or one galaxy in our field of view throughout the night, so we can use very long shutter speeds in order to do it. Now, I've used lots of trackers in my life. I started with the iOptron Sky Tracker, I moved up to the Sky Guider, and then the Sky Guider Pro, and finally the Fornax. And so I have a lot of perspective on what makes a good tracker and what doesn't. So what I want to do today is look at the Fornax and break down what makes it awesome, as well as the downsides of a tracker like this one. The first two criteria that I want to look at with the Fornax are the tracking accuracy and the ease of alignment, because in my experience, those are the two things that really make or break a tracker like this. The first, the tracking accuracy, is super important. It's probably the most important factor when looking at mounts. What a more accurate tracker will give you is the ability to use a longer shutter speed. So as an example, if you are shooting without a tracker, let's just say you've got just a tripod with a ball head, you're going to be limited by the 300 rule or the 400 rule, which delineates how long of a shutter speed you can use without your stars trailing in the frame. When you add a tracker into the mix, a lot of people think, oh, that unlocks unlimited tracking potential, like I can shoot for hours and hours and hours. And that's actually not true. Most trackers have a limit where the mechanics of the tracker start to break down and you're limited to maybe 30 second shutter speeds, maybe 60 second shutter speeds, or a little bit higher depending on how nice the mount is. Well, the Fornax kicks the absolute crap out of the iOptron. Um, after using the iOptron for years, the longest shutter speed I was ever able to get with about a 200 to 300 millimeter lens was around 60 seconds. Sometimes I could get to 120 seconds, but usually I was in that 30 to 60 second range. The Fornax, the first night out, I was shooting four and five minute exposures with absolutely no trailing at the same focal length. Now the reason that this is possible is the iOptron uses a big gear with a worm gear that turns it. And that worm gear turns the big gear once every 24 hours. And the problem is anytime you have gearing, you have periodic error and all kinds of different things when those gears mesh together that just makes things not work quite as well. Well, the Fornax works differently. The Fornax actually has a motor and this gray uh, piece of metal here actually slides here and there's a groove and there's actually a rubber roller inside of this black area that spins and it moves this gray piece of metal between the two parts. And what that does is that allows it to be much more precise because it eliminates any imprecisions in gear mesh which really plagues almost every tracker on the market. So that's super awesome. That lets us get way longer. Now you may say, well, Forrest, okay, four minutes instead of 30 seconds. Like, what's the big deal? Well, let's think about that. If we can use four minute exposures instead of 30 second exposures, all of a sudden that's 30 seconds to one minute is one stop, one minute to two minutes is two stops, and two minutes to, three, to four minutes is three stops. So that's three stops more light that this tracker lets you bring in, which means you can use three stops lower of an ISO. So instead of 3200, you'll be at 1600, 800, 400 ISO, which is a huge advantage when it comes to getting a better signal to noise ratio in your images. So to start with, the tracking accuracy of this thing is amazing, like unbeatable. It's almost better than my, my Lost Mandy G11, which is my big observatory level mount. So super sweet. Now, thing number two that I want to look at that's super important is the ease of alignment. And what I mean by that is when you get out in the field, this is the kind of thing that you're going to bring with you. You're going to take with you to a, uh, a dark sky site or you're going to use it in your backyard, but you're going to take it down every night. You're going to be putting it up and taking it down. 
And so the ease of aligning it with Polaris in the Northern Hemisphere or the Southern Cross in the Southern Hemisphere becomes super important because of the regularity that you're gonna do that. And the biggest advantage that this has over the Ioptron trackers is the base. This is the FMW200 base that Fornax sells. And this thing is a beefy piece of milled aluminum. It's very high quality, it's very thick, it's robust and there's a lot of locking knobs. And I can say from experience that when you lock these knobs down and you have Polaris where it should be in your polar scope, there's no moving, it's, it's very rock steady. The experience on the, on the uh, Ioptron products, at least the, the ones that I've used, is very opposite. You'll lock the knobs down and then you'll move your camera to point at a different area of the sky. And as soon as you do that, the, the Polaris will fall out of alignment just because of the weight shift on the setup. So the fact that this base is very robust is awesome. Um, you even kind of, this is kind of hammered home by the fact that William Optics even sells an aftermarket base for the Ioptron trackers because they recognize that that base is a big weak point. So ease of alignment is a huge plus. Now on the topic of ease of alignment, this thing comes with a polar scope, which is a little scope that you look through in order to align it. Well, because of the tracking accuracy of this mount, how good it is, I opted to add the opted, <laughs> I optron, uh, I opted to add the QHY Pole Master scope to mine. So I actually unscrew this, and this is a little CCD camera that has its own piece of software that aids in aligning it more accurately to the North Star or the North Celestial Pole or the South Celestial Pole. So I highly recommend this because of the increased tracking accuracy. I recommend adding something like this instead of using the polar scope because that will give you a better alignment which will let you stretch that shutter speed even further when you're shooting. So super awesome win there. Basically, the way that I would nail this down, if price, and we'll get to price in a minute, but if price was no issue, this thing is literally better than, than the other trackers that most people consider in almost every way. I highly recommend that. Now, with all of that said, let's get into the cons of the product, because there are definitely some downsides. The first one that I want to mention is price. Um, the Ioptron Skyguider can be bought for around $400 usually. Pretty similar, that's about what the price usually hangs around. This, as configured with the polar scope and things like that, um, is around about a thousand. So the price goes way, way, way up. But this is almost at a different level of tracker. This is getting into the professional tier where you could actually use this to create very high-end astrophotos, and you could grow with this much more than the Ioptron. I've had a few students buy Ioptron, uh, and I don't mean to hate on all Ioptron products. I'm specifically talking Ioptron Skyguider and Sky Tracker. I've had a lot of students buy those and a few months later, they're already feeling like they've outgrown it. This I think gives the ability to grow a lot more with the product and really start to use it longer and longer, especially if you add something like the Pole Master for better alignment. Another big con that I'd like to mention about this mount is the limited range with which it can track. And what I mean by that is this gray metal piece right here only moves from right here to over on this other side, right about here. And that gives us a very limited range of tracking before you have to recenter the target and move it back to the other side, because this only moves one way through the night. The Ioptron Skyguider and Sky Tracker, they can do a full 24 hour rotation without needing any sort of realignment or resetting of the object in the frame. And what that just means is, with the Ioptron products, I can go to sleep, I can let my mount run all night long, and I never have to do any maintenance. With this one, every couple hours I gotta set an alarm, I gotta go outside, I need to slew this back to where it started, recenter my object, and then let another two hours elapse. Not a huge deal for me, because usually I'm checking focus every couple hours anyway, as to not waste time on clear skies, but it's definitely worth mentioning. Both this and the Sky Guider have the ability to be guided, so you can definitely guide this thing. Um, you can use a, an, a separate guide scope if you want to, to increase the precision. But again, if you're getting four minute subs or four minute exposures out of this thing, the need for guiding is much smaller, which is definitely pretty awesome. 
One other thing worth mentioning is that this runs off of 12 volt, whereas the Ioptron guiders run off of a five volt USB connection. So you need a little bit of a special cable in order to run this off of your traditional USB battery bank. I'll put a link down in the description for that. Um, but they make little adapters. You just have to adapt up the five volts that a battery bank gives off at up to 12 volts in order for this to work. Totally doable, just requires an extra cable. Um, they do include a cigarette lighter attachment. So if you wanna run it off your car, that's a great way to do it. I just am usually not close enough to my car in order to make that practical. Another thing to think about with this mount is the fact that because it's so good, it really starts to bring out the other imperfections in your system. And what I mean by that is, when I'm saying that you get four minute exposures with this mount, that's four minutes with all else being as good as possible. What I mean by that is I am mounting this mount to a very beefy tripod. Um, I use the Robus 5558, which is actually something that I've reviewed on this channel before. I'll leave the link to that in the description, but it's a very beefy carbon fiber tripod, very thick, very heavy duty. It's not something that I bought at Walmart for 50 bucks. So if you are mounting this to a lower end tripod, you're not gonna be able to get those same results that I'm quoting because the tripod itself will be a little wobbly. On top of that, you're gonna want a good head to mount to the top of this mount. If the head you're using is crappy, again, you're gonna run into issues where the mount is doing as good as it can do, but because you're mounting subpar support equipment to it, you're gonna run into issues. For me personally, the Robus 5558 tripod has been perfect with this, and then I mount a Kirk Enterprises BH3 ball head to the top, and finally my Fuji X-H1 with a 40 to 150 lens on top of that. And that's been my setup for most everything with this mount. And again, at 200 millimeters, I'm getting three, four, five minute sub exposures very, very easily. So definitely budget in not just the cost of the mount, but also the cost of the, the polar scope if you wanna do that, or the, the QHY uh, pole master, or a better tripod, or a better head. The weight capacity of this mount is around about 13 pounds, which is quite a bit higher than the Ioptron Skyguider or Skytracker. Um, the big disadvantage though is that that great weight capacity is the physical capabilities of the mount itself, not necessarily, like I said earlier, the support equipment. And one thing that I noticed was by screwing my ball head onto this plate right here, when I did that, I had to make sure that it was really reamed down because if it was ever at the right angle, um, the mount was able to handle the weight of my rig, but the rig, if it was at the wrong position, would actually start to unscrew the ball head from the mount. So it was very important to really crank that down to make sure that I was able to do that. Now, I should also say uh, this mount is one of those things that's gonna have a little bit of a learning curve. And I would say that with all of these mounts, I think that's something that a lot of uh, beginner astrophotographers kind of take for granted. They buy one of these and then they think, oh, it's easy, and they go out and they're they're kind of flabbergasted and flummoxed at how to set it up. Um, this takes a little bit of getting used to, especially the resetting every two hours. It's definitely um, a little bit of an extra step from those other ones. But here's the way that I would conclude this. I think if you are just looking to dabble your feet in astrophotography, maybe it's something you've never done and you wanna find out whether it's right for you, I would probably pick up something like the Ioptron Sky Tracker, the very low end, I think it's about $250. Awesome, real low barrier to entry. You can mount it on your tripod you already have, put the head you already have on it, and you can be off to the races and see whether this is something for you. If on the other hand, you have gotten pretty far with your astrophotography and you are looking to do more, or you know it's something that you're gonna like, I would definitely spend the money on the Fornax. I think the added cost here of two to three times as much pays for itself in the ability to grow with this thing. Astrophotography is what some would call a money pit. You're gonna be sinking a lot of funds into this hobby as you grow with it. And this is one of those things that will grow with you. And when you get a new camera or you get a new telescope, chances are this can still perform, whereas a cheaper product might not be able to. If you guys like this video, I would love it if you would hit that like button. If you guys are in the mood for seeing some more nerdy astrophotography content, nerdier than this channel provides. Uh, I've put a link to Fofo Astro down in the description. That's my own personal channel where I do super nerdy astrophotography stuff. So definitely check that out. If you guys want less nerdy, more applicable photography topics, hit subscribe down in the cor corner and subscribe to RMSP's channel. And lastly, special thanks to Canon for sponsoring this video. Woo!